Cardinals uh, knocked out two games at the end of a uh, road home stand, or just a, a road trip for the Phillies just last weekend, and uh, they haven't recovered from that. So they lost to the Blue Jays last night. But let's get to Nate. Nate is a great real estate leader, uh, not only in St. Louis, but in the realtor community as well. Um, Nate is a past president of the Missouri Association of Realtors, um, and he has done a lot of stuff for the National Association with public and federal issues. Um, he's a great leader and instructor. He believes in developing agents and helping them to be their best. So we are really super lucky and grateful to have Nate here with us today. So Nate, good morning. Good morning. Thanks so much, Matt. And thank you all for having me uh, in Philadelphia this morning. Um, you know, you mentioned that the uh, Cardinals taking two out of three was uh, bad news. It all depends on your perspective, certainly. Um, but uh, yes, hopefully you guys will recover. Uh, we are on a nice roll, which is great. And hopefully we'll uh, maybe see you in the playoffs. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. I'm looking forward to talking with you this morning. And we're gonna talk about fair housing, the history of fair housing. We're gonna focus on fair housing. And the goal is to have a conversation. So if you have questions, comments, things like that, just shout it out, unmute yourself and shout it out. Don't feel like you're interrupting my flow at all. And if, um, you know, if you prefer, you can write it in the chat. So uh, please use the chat box, not the Q&A, and I'll see the chat. And if you've got questions or comments there, I'll work to try to respond to those in that format as well. So with that, let's kick it off. And you know what we know about fair housing is we're gonna have to take a little bit of a history lesson, okay? Because in order for us to understand where we're at today and how our communities developed in the way that they have developed in our nation, we really need to understand where we've been. So we're gonna go back in time a little bit. We're gonna go back to 1865. Okay, who remembers 1865? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you. All right, fantastic. Um, what was happening in 1865? What was happening in our nation in 1865? Anybody remember? Okay, I see some mouths moving. Okay. So yes, that is correct. The Civil War was ending. The Civil War was ending in 1865, and we had, uh, we, you know, we had a challenge. Thank you, Melody, for putting that in the chat. Uh, we had a challenge in our society because our country was torn apart. And what is it that we were going to do to sort of bring everybody together in our country? And of course, we had President Abraham Lincoln. And you know, what he said was, with malice towards none and charity for all, let's heal the nation's wounds. That's really what he wanted to do was heal the nation's wounds from this terrible war that we endured as a nation. And we had these people, we have these recently enslaved people in our nation who were, you know, wasn't clear about what kind of rights they would have on how they would be integrated into our society. We know what was taking place because what happened is that when the Civil War ended, it wasn't a, you know, a smooth transition from being enslaved to being free. It was basically, okay, you're free now and off you go, you know, no uh, Holiday Inn voucher, no nothing. You know, you're just kind of out there to fend for yourself. And we've got to figure out as a nation what rights these individuals are going to have in terms of, in terms of how they're going to be integrated into our society. So President Lincoln dispatched um, General George Tecumseh Sherman, General D George Tecumseh Sherman, and to talk with um, a gentleman by the name of Garrison Frazier, who was recently enslaved, and he was a leader of the, you know, a, 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 somewhat of a leader of the free men and women, and a spokesperson, if you will. And what General Sherman did was pretty remarkable given the time. He asked the question. He said, what do you want? What is it that you want for your own people? And that's a profound question to ask because it would have been very simple in 1865 for him to go there and prescribe what 
the recently enslaved African Americans needed and should have. But instead, he asked the question about what it was that they wanted. And Garrison Frazier, who again, spokesperson for the freemen, said, you know, what we need is we need land. You know, we need, you know, if we have our own land, then we can till it and turn it with our own labor. We can maintain it ourselves and and we can, you know, grow crops. We can, you know, build homes and we can be self-sufficient in this nation. And that's really how we're going to be able to integrate into society. So that made a lot of sense to General Sherman. So he took it back to President Lincoln, made a lot of sense to President Lincoln as well. So he enacted some legislation. So he had what we know as special field order number 15. Special field order number 15 said this, the islands from Charleston South, the abandoned rice fields along the rivers for 30 miles back from the sea and the country bordering the St. Johns River in Florida are reserved and set apart for the settlement of the Negroes now made free by the acts of war and the proclamation of the president of the United States. So there we have it. Now, you may know this as 40 acres and a mule. You may have heard it as being said as 40 acres and a mule because each family was supposed to get 40 acres, um, but there was no mule involved. But at any rate, this was special field order number 15. And here it is, we solved it. You know, we've uh, provided some opportunities for the freedmen and women to begin to become self-sufficient um, and integrate into the society here in the United States. Um, but what happened? Didn't quite take hold. And I'll tell you why. Because unfortunately, President Lincoln had a very rough night in the theater not too long after that. And as a result, after his assassination, we saw President Andrew Johnson come to power and secede him as president of the United States. He had a completely different view on this particular issue. And he said, look, there's no way we're giving these, you know, these former slaves all of this land. So he took the land back and he gave it back to the uh, former uh, slave owners and plantation owners that once had it. And um, that was it. So now the freedmen and women were still sort of in limbo. They didn't have any uh, opportunities. And we as a nation still needed to figure that out. So it was up to Congress. And in 1866, Congress put, sent to the desk of President Johnson a civil rights bill. And it says, such citizens of every race and color and without regard of any previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude shall have the same rights in every state and territory to purchase, inherit, lease, sell, hold, and convey real and personal property to the full and equal benefit as enjoyed by white citizens. So there we have it. 1866, the Civil Rights Bill becomes law. By the way, President Johnson vetoed it twice, and it wasn't until there was a two-thirds majority vote by Congress that it did become law. But once it did become law, we settled it. We solved it. Housing discrimination in America is over. Racism no longer exists in the United States, 1866. Right? You still with me? Okay. All right. Okay. That's right. We didn't quite solve housing discrimination. We didn't quite solve racism in 1866. And one of the reasons for that, feel free to throw it in the chat box if you have an idea of why this may have not solved it. But I will share with you one of the reasons, the, the, one of the primary reasons I would say that that didn't happen is because there was no enforcement provisions. So although this law was in place, there wasn't anybody enforcing it and there wasn't anything that said what was going to happen if you didn't, um, you know, adhere to this civil rights bill. And this brings me to a very important point and that I think that sometimes we lose sight of when we're talking about legislation and laws and things like that. If we don't change the hearts and minds of people, then it doesn't matter what the law says. Yes, there's gonna be plenty of people that will adhere to a law because it's a law, but there's gonna be a lot more people that are gonna find a way to circumvent that law because they don't like the implications of it. 
And often they don't like the implications of it because they don't really understand it. And what we have to do as a society, and I'm talking about 2022 society, what we have to do is find ways to educate people and help bring them around to a level of understanding that shows them that, hey, a rising tide lifts all boats. It's not a zero sum game. Everyone can be successful in this country and have the opportunity to be successful. And our success is not only is not dependent upon holding one particular group or several particular groups down uh, at the expense of others. That's uh, or, or to the benefit of others. That's just not how it works. So yes. Yeah, so in 1866. So let's go back to 1866. 1866. No enforcement provisions. So this bill didn't really do a whole lot, except for, you know, it, I mean, it did something, you know, it, 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 it made a statement, but it, again, the enforcement provisions weren't, weren't there. Um, Melody mentions Jim Crow. We're going to talk about that in just a second. And because we, what we saw in 1866 is we saw, you know, we started to see some opportunities for African Americans in our nation, because not only did we get this civil rights bill that became law, but by 1870, you know, we had uh, our first African American congressman who was Senator Hiram Revels of Mississippi. And we had the first representative, Joseph Rainey from South Carolina, and they became the first African Americans to serve in Congress. Now, having said that, several congressmen would be elected over the next several years. And in fact, if you look at just about seven years later, there were eight congressmen in, there were, there were actually, uh, there was uh, the, the second US Senator was elected and there were eight congressmen in Congress. Um, now what's interesting and maybe remarkable about that is that it would be nearly a hundred years from this time before we would see a third African-American senator and nearly a hundred years from this time before we would see anything near eight congressmen in the United States, eight African-American congressmen in the um, United States House of Representatives. And the reason that that occurred, um, Melody is way ahead of us, was Jim Crow. Jim Crow is what happened. And as W.E.B. Du Bois said, the slave went free, stood for a brief moment in the sun, then moved back again towards slavery. And the reason that this happened was, uh, we go to 1877. Anybody recognize who this is? Nobody recognizes who this is. That's fine. I'll tell you. That is Rutherford B. Hayes. Rutherford B. Hayes. Oh, look at that. Melody did chime in. Rutherford, yes. So Rutherford B. Hayes, um, he was the governor in Ohio, and he was running to become president in, uh, in 1877. And he was running against a, a guy by the name of, of uh, Samuel Tilden, who was governor uh, out of New York. And there was a contentious race, and we didn't really know who was going to emerge victorious out of this contest. So it was very savvy of Ruffy to go to the Southern unreconstructed states and say, hey, look, if you support me to become president, then I'll remove all of the federal troops from your states and let you do what you see as best in terms of dealing with the, um, uh, the freed men and women. I'm sure you'll do the right thing. So they said, that sounds good to us. And they supported Rutherford B. Hayes. And as a result, he did become president of the United States. And he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He removed those federal troops from the South. And as a result, we uh, saw the end of Reconstruction. And in the words of uh, Emancipator Frederick Douglass, he said that the freedmen were left naked unto their enemies. And that's what we were dealing with uh, at that time. Now, that moves us, uh, you know, uh, that moves us into the early 1900s. Because what we've got here is we've got a lot of folks that were 
a lot of folks that were, um, you know, obviously disenfranchised and didn't have rights. And what we needed to figure out was what specific rights and opportunities were going to be afforded to the emancipated people in our country. And because as we know, as we saw, the uh, Jim Crow laws came in and really, uh, and, and really reversed all the gains that the African Americans had, uh, had, had received since the Emancipation Proclamation. So as a result, uh, folks were moving. They needed to get out of there. They wanted to escape the antebellum South. So by 1910, we had more than 19, uh, 90% of African Americans lived in the South. And about 50 years later, that number was cut in half because by 1970, there was less than 50% of African Americans living in the South. So that was a great migration, moving north and west for warmer suns, so to speak, for greener pastures, all of that, better opportunities. And it worked in many cases, but, um, uh, oh, I think the light just went out on me. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. Let me mute this for a second, see if I can get my light back on. Okay, hey, you, you don't see me? You, Great, all right. You don't have a stage crew there? <laughs> 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 so I'm at my office and I'm in my office at my office. And what happens is there's a switch outside. So people are just getting here, you know, for the morning and they flip the switch and it goes it's like a, you know, a, a reversible switch that goes both ways. Okay. So if you can see me, that's fine. Um, then we'll just keep it moving. And um, let's see, where were we at? We were talking about the great migration. So the great migration as African-Americans were moving North and West for greater opportunities. And what we know is um, that housing options were limited. Housing options were limited and they were looking for more housing opportunities. And unfortunately it was around that time that they ran into us. And when I say us, I'm talking about us as the National Association of Realtors, our precursor, which was the, our, you know, before we renamed ourselves, we were known as the National Association of Real Estate Boards. And in 1924, we felt the need to amend our code of ethics. And the reason for that is because of this great migration that was occurring, and we needed to figure out what we were going to do. And what we did as Realtors, we, put into our code of ethics, Article 34. Article 34 reads, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or any individuals whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. That was us as the National Association of Realtors. So that um, was in our code of ethics, and that was because as African Americans started to make their way north and west, um, looking for housing opportunities, and a lot of neighborhoods did not want the integration of African Americans and others within their community. So then this became codified by our National Association of Realtors. So that brings us to the 30s. Uh, what happened in the 1930s? What were we looking at in the mid, early 1930s in our nation? Depression. Thank you, Katie. Yes, we were in the throes of the Great Depression. And, you know, I'll tell you, if you're already down and out trying to find opportunities, you run into a depression, that's just going to make it even tougher because everybody, a, a lot of people were standing in line for soups and, you know, out of work. And it was just a very tough time for our fragile democracy. And I say our fragile democracy because people were wondering, is this going to work? Are we going to be able to make it through this? We saw prosperity taking hold in Europe. And it's like, hmm, hmm, is that the way to go? Should we look at something like that? Should we emulate that kind of model? But Frederick Roosevelt said that, um, you know, the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. And he was talking about the depression. He was talking about our fear of this, uh, this challenge that we were working to emerge from. 
So what he did was he got his, um, he you know, passed some legislation, the New Deal, uh, which was a jobs program. The New Deal was a jobs program to create more opportunities to get men back to work. And I say get men back to work because at the time, you know, women represented very, very, very few, um, uh, you know, very small percentage of the workforce. It was men that needed to get back to work uh, at the time. So also as part of the New Deal, um, he, had, he, he passed the Federal Housing Act, the, the National Housing Act, excuse me. So the National Housing Act, what it did is it created the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, which of course we all know whose purpose is uh, to establish, uh, you know, to make credit more available for lenders and um, to, uh, to, to make credit more available for lenders to create more opportunities for home ownership. And, you know, we would see these types of advertisements in the 30s, pay rent to yourself. Under FHA, you can own your own home now the happiness and wisdom of home ownership. Um, because during this time in the 1930s, it was, um, you know, home ownership wasn't something that everybody had access to. We were looking at about 30% rate of home ownership on our nation. And that, you know, was, it wasn't something that was for the everyday folks. It was, a, it was something that was more for the wealthy class of people for the most part. But then what we saw is after the FHA was created, it really made housing explode. And we saw the rate of home ownership in our nation double in just about 30 years. And we got up to over 60% by the mid 1960s. And that's because the FHA made credit more available and lowered the down payment requirements and really created a unified way of um, you know, of, of distributing these loans and, and uh, in helping banks to insure and insuring the loans for the banks. Now, the challenge, of course, is that this was not available for everyone. So the FHA, as Stephen just mentioned, unfortunately, the FHA was instrumental in redlining. That's absolutely right, Stephen, because when we look at the time that the FHA loan was created in 1934 to the 1968, when the Federal Fair Housing Act was passed, we saw less than 2%, 1%, 2% of FHA loans being issued to non-Caucasians within our country. And that was, uh, uh, you know, that, that was a huge challenge. And that really put many of us behind the eight ball in terms of creating economic opportunities. And here we see this is the FHA underwriting manual. So this is from 1938, FHA underwriting manual. And what they had was, uh, as you can see here, um, racial occupancy designation. You had white neighborhoods, mixed neighborhoods, foreign neighborhoods, and Negro neighborhoods. So what we've got here is, this is FHA underwriting manual. It says, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that property shall be continued to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally contributes to instability and a decline in values. This was uh, the FHA underwriting manual. It went on to say that recorded deed restrictions should strengthen and supplement zoning ordinances. The prohibition of occupancy of properties except by the race for which they are intended. So these were things that our FHA underwriting manual said, and we as realtors really, you know, work to make sure that this stuff took hold because as Stephen says, uh, see almost every town named Levittown, which we'll talk about, um, but the redlining, the redlining was something that we created, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, um, created these maps and we as realtors informed how these maps would be created. And the way that it looked is that we would have areas that were in red were deemed hazardous. And the way that we decided what was a hazardous neighborhood was if black and brown folks lived there. That's what we did. And, um, you know, I say, uh, you know, th th that's what we were doing at the time. And you see, you've got areas that were best, areas that were still desirable and declining. 
Now, another thing that the FHA loan was doing is it was helping to stabilize some of these areas because remember, we were in a Great Depression. So the FHA loan funds were used to help to uh, stave off foreclosure from some folks, but folks that lived in these red areas and that owned homes, no, 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 we're not gonna, we're not gonna invest in any of those neighborhoods. We're not going to insure any mortgage in those neighborhoods and provide any assistance. So it further depressed those neighborhoods. And if you look at the red line maps today, because this is a map of St. Louis, it certainly wasn't just in St. Louis. This is Los Angeles, 1939. Here's one of Cleveland. Um, and here is one of Columbus, uh, this all over the country. And oh, look, here we are. Here is one of Philadelphia. So this was all over. You know, this was not something that was unique to any part of the country. This was nationwide um, and, and certainly, in, uh, certainly all over the North. That is for sure. So, you know, what we were looking at was, you know, we see signs in neighborhoods. We want white tenants in our white community. We serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans, um, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Yes, Irish. Irish were very heavily discriminated against, as were most first and second generation immigrants into our country. But Irish, unlike African Americans, were able to, to assimilate into um, normal uh, normal, you know, what we would call traditional American culture. So um, Italians, Irish, those folks, because they are white, were able to sort of become just white as opposed to African Americans and other, uh, you know, uh, other folks that just can't change their skin color. So it's something that that, assim that assimilation process doesn't really occur uh, in, in, uh, in our nation as a result of that. Now we see some text down here. It says, none of the said lands, interest therein, or improvements therein shall be sold, resold, conveyed, leased, rented to, or any other way used or occupied by any person of Negro blood or of any person of the Semitic race, blood, or origin, which racial description shall be deemed to include Armenians, Jews, Hebrews, Persians, or Syrians. And we know that as a restrictive covenant, a racially based restrictive covenant. And we would see that all over the country in neighborhoods as well, because the federal government made racial zoning illegal. However, this was a good way to sort of circumvent that racial zoning, uh, uh, the, the, the illegal nature of the racial zoning. And again, as I said before, it's about changing hearts and minds and it's about educating people because if we don't educate people about why these things are good, uh, why integration can benefit communities, then they're going to find ways to circumvent those laws and policies that have been created. So that brings us to uh, the 1940s. So what was happening in the mid 1940s? What was happening in the mid 1940s? World War II, that is correct. World War II, thank you, Melody, uh, was wrapping up and the soldiers were coming home. The boys were coming home from overseas and there was a housing shortage. Now, you know, you may have a housing shortage in Philadelphia right now. I know we certainly have one in St. Louis in terms of when homes come on the market, they're selling just like that still, even though interest rates are rising a bit, things may be slowing down ever so slightly, but still, it's still a very robust seller's market. Well, let me tell you about the seller's market that it would have been in 1945. 1945, Levittown. So this development, when it was first taking reservations in the first three hours that it took reservations, three hours, they reserved 1,200 homes, 1,200 homes in three hours. So that is a housing shortage for you. And although African-Americans and others were building these homes, none of them were able to occupy them because this was an FHA development and FHA wasn't insuring homes in integrated neighborhoods. So this was a white neighborhood. And William Levitt, who was the developer of Levittown um, and developed many Levittowns across the East Coast, as you know, um, he, although he was Jewish himself, 
would not sell homes to other Jews. Uh, that was just part of the policy. And that was part of the FHA uh, insurance that was, that, was, that was part of this development. So that was Levittown. Now, when we look at the cost of these homes, they were very affordable because when we're looking at $1,945, uh, it cost about $8,000, $8,000. So that was twice the median income average in the United States at that time. So if we look at today, that would be about $100,000. And so as you can see, that's very affordable home for someone. Now, African-Americans and other minorities were able to buy homes you know, across the tracks, so to speak, and um, in other neighborhoods. But those neighborhoods were different than Levittown. You know, those neighborhoods were the places that were where they'd run the freeway through or, you know, they'd allow the pig farm to be here. They'd have things in the neighborhood that no one would want in their own neighborhood. Um, this is where, um, you know, the liquor stores and things like that would be able to, to, be, to occupy, but they wouldn't be in the other neighborhoods. So as a result, you'd have a lack of infrastructure as well and just a lack of overall investment. So those neighborhoods didn't really uh, appreciate and value like Levittown. Because today we look at Levittown and we see those homes selling for what, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars in many cases. And you know, the homes across the tracks, those are still selling for about a hundred thousand dollars. So what we saw is little to zero wealth accumulation through appreciation in home ownership in communities that African Americans were able to invest in home ownership. Whereas in these other communities, we saw massive rates of appreciation and wealth accumulation that was available. And now people may say, uh, well, Nate, I mean, the Fair Housing Act was in 1968. Why didn't we, they just, you know, they could have bought a house at that point. Well, unfortunately, what happened is that a lot of the opportunity had passed by folks because, you know, even if, even if, in 1968, the, that made it, that, that, that solved the issue if, and that's a big if, we know that's not really the case, that didn't solve it. But even if it solved it, then you would have to say, okay, now you can buy a home um, when, and now you've got to pay what the home has appreciated for. So think about it like Monopoly. We all play Monopoly. We're realtors. Imagine somebody, you know, you playing the game, and every, all the other players in the game are able to go around the board four or, or five times before you're able to even start. Now, what's going to happen in that game of Monopoly by the time you get to leave go? What's going to happen is the properties are no longer going to be available. They're going to be bought. People have built houses and hotels are going to be expensive. Um, you might not even get Baltic Avenue and Mediterranean Avenue. They might not even be available anymore. Um, but that's what's going to happen. So now you're behind and it's going to be very difficult for you to catch up because you started so far behind. And in our country, we didn't allow some people to go around the board four or five times. We allowed 30, 40, 50, 70 years around the board before we allowed opportunities for many of our, uh, many of our fellow citizens to to get opportunities, uh, the, the same or similar opportunities. And that is what's really created the uh, racial wealth gap that we see in our nation today. And if we look, you know, we saw that to be the case, Philadelphia. Here's Philadelphia in 1941. So in 1941, Philadelphia's African-American population grew from nearly 251,000 to more than 376,000 people. Um, so there was a severe housing shortage that was faced because there was only 1,044 of the 140,000 housing units built during that period that were available to African-Americans. So you saw less than a percent of housing being available for African-Americans in Philadelphia uh, during that period. So that moves us to 1948. 1948, we have a Supreme Court case. This is Shelley versus Kramer. So the Shelley family, 
bought a home, uh, you know, bought a home in a neighborhood and um, uh, the Kramer family said, no, 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 you're African-American, you can't live here. Now you might say, well, Nate, how did they even buy that home in the neighborhood if African-Americans weren't allowed based on racially based restrictive covenants? Well, what happened is that their attorney who um, was white said, you know what, I believe that everyone should have an opportunity to live wherever they can afford. So he acted as a straw buyer for the Shelley family so that they could purchase that home. And of course, it was quite a surprise when they moved in instead of the attorney whose name was actually on the contract. So that's how it ended up going to court. Now, Shelley family said, we bought this house fair and square. Um, you know, we should have a right to occupy this. Kramer family said, nope, we got these covenants and you got to get out. So the Supreme Court said this. They said that racially based restrictive covenants on their face are not invalid under the terms of the 14th Amendment. And they may be privately enforced. However, there will be no judicial action or judicial enforcement to, um, to, to enforce such a restrictive covenant because it would constitute state action. So let me break that down. What they are saying is that if neighbor A in community A says, I'm going to sell my house to anybody whose money's green, I don't care, then there's going to be no repercussions, no legal action that would fall on them, nor no legal actions falling on the minority who was able to purchase that home and move into the neighborhood. They'd be able to legally occupy that. However, if neighbor B says, you know what, I'm only going to sell my home to white folks because that's what our restrictive covenants say, then that's what would happen. And again, there would be no recourse for the person who denied housing opportunities to everyone. So that's what they said. So they kind of punted. They said, you know what, communities, we're going to leave it up to you to do what you think is best. We heard that before, didn't we? Um, I think that's what Ruthie had to say back in 1877. So that was, that was uh, Shelley versus Kramer. Now, it did create some opportunities. It was not all bad. It didn't do everything that it could, but it did create some opportunities. Hansberry decision was a uh, you know, sort of sister decision to that. It opened up new homes to, to, you know, for, for, for different races uh, in the Chicago area. Um, Thurgood Marshall, who's pictured here, he was uh, the judge, excuse me, the, uh, uh, he later became Supreme Court Justice, but he was the attorney who was working on this case. So that moves us along to 1949. 1949, we saw the Housing Act passed. Now, this was passed in terms of, in, in, as a way to, you know, to help, uh, help address the decline of urban housing. What was really happening was there was a lot of neighborhoods that a lot of areas that were just so um, disenfranchised and lacked investment, but they were in areas that um, powers that be wanted to redevelop. So as a result, they said, you know what? We're gonna move you out of here. We're gonna call this urban renewal. And urban renewal was often dubbed Negro removal because that's what was happening in a lot of these communities to make way for uh, other types of developments. And it displaced uh, you know, people who, from the places, the only places that they've ever known. Because remember, housing was so, housing options were so limited for African Americans and others. We talked about Philadelphia, out of 150,000 housing units being built, just over a thousand were made available for African Americans. So there were very limited opportunities in during that period of time for African Americans. So how that was addressed, we saw. Well, places like this, Pruitt Igo, high rise public housing developments that were that were that were being constructed. And those were being con constructed to, you know, sort of, you know, have places to put African Americans and other folks that were displaced from some of these, some of the uh, the, the sort of um, urban slums that had been created. And but certainly these places became the same way because what we saw was a lack of investment in infrastructure maintenance. When, these, when this particular development was first built, it was for both 
white citizens and black citizens. You had half the Pruitt side was for whites, the Igo side for blacks. And what would happen is that public housing was deemed as something that was temporary. You're supposed to get there, get back on your feet, save a few dollars and go rent a place, go buy a place. And that was what was happening for many folks. But again, not everybody had those same opportunities. And in Philadelphia, it was, it was, you know, it was certainly an issue as well. This is 1954. This is Mayor Joseph Clark, who signed the Housing Act that required developers to build one new housing unit for every family displaced when the city cleared um, those sort of slum areas, which affected working class African Americans. So this was certainly something that Philadelphia was dealing with uh, at the time as, uh, you know, similar to the rest of the country. So as we saw housing opportunities become available and you saw people looking desperately to escape some of these urban slums and these uh, conditions that, that, that they were in, it sort of ushered in the era of someone else who could take advantage of that opportunity. And we call those blockbusters. Blockbusters did a couple of things. So first, they would go into neighborhoods where white families lived and would, would peddle fear. They would say, hey, look, <clears throat> this fifth, the Smith family down the street just sold their house to an African-American family. You better sell me your house while you still can at a discount and get out of here. That's what they were doing. And unfortunately, this was working because the white families who were fearful of African-Americans would sell their home at a discount. So now the blockbusters would have those homes and be able to do other things with them, which we'll talk about in just a second. But I wanna focus on the white families that, was, that were selling their homes to these blockbusters. They were giving into this fear. We've gotta remember, this is very important, is that we're talking about the 1950s. Most white families had very little interaction with African-Americans and other minorities. So as a result, the only thing that they knew about them was what they heard on the news, what their friends and family said, you know, these sort of urban myths that they heard, you know, black folks eat their children, whatever, you know, those types of things, that would be what but most, most people had to go by. Um, so when they were sort of given this opportunity to sell their home and get out of this neighborhood because black folks were moving in, they took it. And also, there's another reason. We talked about FHA not insuring mortgages in integrated neighborhoods. So what that meant is that if your neighborhood starts to become integrated, then all of a sudden that FHA loan is no longer going to be available should you decide to sell. And that's going to limit the opportunities that you have. So those were a couple of reasons that blockbusters were successful in buying these homes on mass at a discount. So then they would take those homes and they would go back to African Americans who were living in some of these squalid conditions, you know, whether it be uh, in St. Louis, whether it be in Philadelphia or wherever, and they would say, hey, look, you know, we've got a house for you. And African Americans would be like, wow, I can live in that neighborhood. That's a great neighborhood. Yeah, you sure can. But then, you know, it's, but then what would occur is, of course, there'd be no financing available. Blockbusters would say, oh, that's no problem because of course the FHA loan was not gonna be available for an African-American family buying a home into a white community. So that Blockbuster said, we'll carry the paper for you. We'll take care of that. Now, what they did was even more insidious because not only were they selling these properties for 50 to 80% more than what they were worth, but they would sell them on contract for deed basis. So with a contract for deed, you're not accruing any real home ownership until you've made that final payment. So you can have a 10 year note and make your payment on time for nine years. And if you're late once, you can be evicted and you got to have nothing. You can't sell the home during that period either. So you're locked into that. 
So that's what blockbusters were able to do. They were able to trip up African Americans with these um, with these types of loans, and they would be able to repossess these properties and sell them to somebody else. Uh, there was a Duke University study that showed that three quarters, seventy five percent of homes sold to black Chicagoans. So this is in Chicago in the 50s and 60s were contracts for deed. They were marked up 84% on average. Um, so as a result, it resulted in three to $4 billion of wealth lost. Three to $4 billion of wealth lost in the African-American community in Chicago, just in Chicago. And this was happening all over the country. So that is where blockbusters succeeded and thrived and that further uh, pushed African Americans and others, you know, on the sidelines as it relates to um, as, it, as it relates to uh, you know wealth accumulation through home ownership. Prejudices. It is well known are most difficult errat to eradicate from the heart whose soul has never been loosened or fertilized by education. They grow there, firm as weeds among rocks. Charlotte Bronte had that to say, and it goes back to what I was talking about with education, and that's what happens with these prejudices, right? Uh, it's education, it's awareness, it's getting to know each other that really helps us get, um, you know, get to a level of understanding that we can and we should uh, live together and, and, um, and we'll thrive together. So that brings us to Levittown. This time, Levittown, Pennsylvania. All right, so this is 1957. So 1957, William and Daisy Myers moved into Levittown. They were the first African-American family to purchase a home. And the question was, how are they going to be greeted? How are they going to be greeted in the home that they purchased? Now, the Myers family were, you know, they were the type of family that anybody would want as their neighbor. She was a school teacher, I believe, and he was an engineer. They're college educated, you know, nice family, except for they were black. And that was a problem because they were not greeted. Um, you know, you know, one might think that, you know, somebody, you get a new neighbor, you're going to bring them a, you're going to bake them a pie. You're going to bring them a plant. You know, is there anything I could do for you to make your transition to our neighborhood more comfortable? Please let me know happy to help, those sorts of things. That's what we would do for our neighbors, right? So what happened in Levittown? Let's, uh, let's, take a little, let's take a look at this little clip that I wanna show you, just about a couple of attitudes that exist, uh, that existed in that time in this neighborhood. And we understood that it was going to be all white and we were very happy to buy a home here. Do you think a Negro family moving here will affect the community as a whole? Definitely. In what way? I think that, well, the property values will immediately go down if uh, they are allowed to move in here in any number. But there are others who are for the Myers? Yes, I've read about them. For what reason, do you think, do they support the Myers? Frankly, I don't know what reasons they can have for it. If they are... Homeowners in Levittown, I don't see what reasons they can have for it. Do you think Myers will be able to live here comfortably? Comfortably? No. What course of action are you going to follow? I'll do what I can uh, to help to, to get them out legally and peacefully. And as far as accepting them socially, if that's what you mean, I could never do that. Do you think the Myers will be able to live comfortably in Levittown? I think so. I hope so. I think the majority of people here will uh, grow accustomed to it and uh, realize that, oh, they, are, they can be good neighbors, which I'm sure they are. And uh, I think the majority of people here are not vi the violent, um, well, violent group that we have heard so much about. All right, so there we have it. Um, a couple of different perspectives about welcoming the Myers family into Levittown. Now, the first woman, yes, it would be easy for us now here in 2022 to say, oh my gosh, and just wag our finger at her 
Like how, how dare she think that? But again, we're talking about the fifties. Let's break down a couple of things that she said. She said, well, I bought a home in this neighborhood. I understood it was going to be a white neighborhood and I was happy to do that. That's what was happening. There was a bond that existed that said, this was a white neighborhood. This was a black neighborhood. This is how it's going to be. So now all of a sudden you start to see integration and she feels betrayed because that's not what she bought onto. That's not what she signed up for. So that was one uh, thought that she had. She also talked about, and again, you know, why is that the case? Because there was a perception that when African-Americans live in a neighborhood, home values are going to go down. FHA and we as realtors perpetuated this myth, but it wasn't true. It became true because it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. But the reality was that most property values actually went up when African-Americans moved in because African-Americans were able to pay more than their white counterparts for housing because there was fewer choices available for African-Americans because there were some neighborhoods that just flat out wouldn't allow African-Americans to move in. So if you've got limited choices, the choice that you have, you're gonna pay more for. So housing values actually improved in some of those neighborhoods as a result of that. But then when the blockbuster stepped in and started scaring everybody away, buying those homes for a discount, then that started to drive prices down. So it was a self-fulfilling prophecy in that way. Um, and again, when FHA not insuring mortgages, African-American community, it was a institutional sort of way to, um, to sort of push those property values down and ensure that neighborhoods remained segregated. Okay, so another thing that she said, um, you, mean, you, you mean would I accept them socially? I mean, almost like the reporter was crazy for asking that question. I could never do that. I could never do that, right? Because again, she didn't have that interaction with African Americans and others, so she probably, you know, just believes what she saw on TV and you know what maybe friends, family members have said about African Americans. So that was her perspective, um, and that was the perspective of many folks, but not all folks certainly. And what I like to think, because I'm like Anne Frank, you know, I like to believe that you know, despite everything, at heart, people are good, fundamentally good, right? Because I think that more people are like that second woman, because the second woman, she said, uh, you know, the Myers, I'm sure are good neighbors. I'm sure that people are going to welcome them just fine. I don't have any problems with them. You know, this is going to be the person who's going to bring them a pie, right? She, they're gonna, she's going to bake them a pie and say, hey, Myers fam, I'm sorry that you're going through all this trouble with some of these knuckleheads, but that's not everybody here in this neighborhood. I want you to know that we're here to support you and welcome you into the neighborhood and make your transition as comfortable as possible. So what happened is that the Myers family were greeted by three weeks of riots, three weeks of riots outside their front door. There were crosses burned in their yard. But here is the problem. Uh, not that that's not a problem, bricks thrown through their windows, all those things. But not only was this done to the Myers, but also the woman who bakes the pie and brings it over, she gets a cross burned in her yard the next day. She gets bricks thrown through her windows. She's terrorized. She's not able to, you know, she's no longer welcome in the community to go to have afternoon tea with the ladies. Her kids can't play with the other kids in the neighborhood anymore. Um, so her status quo has been disrupted as a result of her being kind to a neighbor. So that's why we would see this silence, because what would happen is the, what, you know, that, that violent vocal minority would win the day because of the, um, the sort of quiet minority would not speak up and not speak that truth that this is not the right thing to do to these folks that just want a place to live and a place to raise their family. So as a result, the, that violent minority would win the day. And when you would see these types of things happening, people would, would they, you know, nobody wants a cross burned in their yard. Nobody wants bricks thrown through their windows. So next time somebody's thinking of baking a pie for the neighbor and they hear the story about what happened to the other lady that did that, they say, ah, 
maybe I'm not going to take this pie over. Maybe I'll just keep it to myself. I don't have any problems with the Myers family, but I don't want to have problems myself. And that is the challenge. That's the big challenge that we face as a society in this country about how are we going to allow or what are we going to allow to those uh, that don't have when we're in a position to maybe do something different, maybe speak that truth. And that's really where we're at. So that was Levittown. So that's Levittown in 1957. And so in fact, you know, um, Dr. King said uh, this time, and he was talking about the civil rights era. He said, this time is not going to be remembered by the violence and vitriol of the bad people, but by the appalling silence of the good people. And I think that that's the challenge is that there were so many people that remained silent during this time. And as a result, there was a lot of injustices that were able to win the day because those were the folks that were most vocal. And we've got to do better than that. So that moves us to 1959. So we've got the Saturday Evening Post. Saturday Evening Post has an article uh, entitled, When a Negro Moves Next Door. And they felt the need to put this out because people didn't know. They were like, oh my gosh, what's, you know, Black people are moving in. What's going on here? What are those people like? And the article was like, hey, look, Black folks are just like you. They want to raise their family. They want to send their kids to school. They want to put food on the table, cut their grass, all of that. The woman pictured here, her name is Estelle Sachs. She is a realtor in Baltimore. She said, hey, look, we cannot be giving into these blockbusters in the way, and we can't, we can't do that. They're destroying our communities. We need to welcome our neighbors and bring them in as part of our community, and we're going to be richer as a result. Um, that's what was happening. Uh, you know, she won in some cases, but she was one of those brave folks that we talk about that was speaking that truth and not as concerned about her own status quo, but more concerned about the, uh, the totality of everyone and, you know, the, the, the cumulative effect that things were having on the community. All right, so does anybody recognize any of these places? Anybody? New England? Mm, no. They're all Pennsylvania counties. Yes, these are all places in Pennsylvania. That is correct. Um, <laughs> you could tell I'm not from Pennsylvania. Yes, they're all places in Pennsylvania. But there's something a little bit more than that, though. Something a little more. These are all known uh, or, or was known at one time as sundown towns. So sundown towns, these are communities where if you are African-American or a person of color, you gotta be out before the sun sets. And these places would have signs that would say that. If you're black, don't let the sun set on you in, you know, plug in the name of the town. And that was something that was happening all across the country, mostly in Northern states, by the way. Um, but this was something that was happening. So this is just another way that uh, discrimination was occurring and keeping people from some of these neighborhoods. And what you might find is that many of these places are still very segregated and are very homogenous. And that's because of some of these policies that these neighborhoods adopted and these communities adopted back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Melody says, I thought this was only in the South. My hometown had this until closer to the late 1970s in South Carolina. No, it was certainly not just in the South. It was more prevalent in Northern, in, in northern communities. Um, and it, this book, Sundown Towns by James Lowen sort of shows that. And you can go to the website and you can see all of the towns in various states that were known to have been sundown towns. And, um, you know, and this is really how we know, you know, this further sort of shows that our communities weren't segregated by accident. And also, 
you know, you mentioned uh, had this until the late 70s. Uh, you know, there's a lot of communities that had this into the 80s. Um, I talked to somebody who said that, you know, I was instructing a class in one community and they said that, oh yeah, you know, I grew up in the 90s and I, you know, I remember when I was young, there was a, there was a sign there uh, in, 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 in his own community. So this was not something that went away when the Fair Housing Act passed in 1968. So again, it created limited opportunities um, for folks who were looking to achieve home ownership. So, uh, so, that, uh, so that brings us to uh, the Phil Philadelphia Fair Housing Commission. So this is 1962. So in 1962, the city council created a Fair Housing Commission as part of the city's first Fair Housing Ordinance. And this prohibited landlords from engaging in unfair housing practices, such as evicting a tenant or raising a tenant's rent in properties that had violated the, the, the city's housing code. So this, um, I got a lot of information about Philadelphia from the Encyclopedia of Greater Philadelphia, um, an article that was written by Pedro Regalado. Um, so there's a lot of information there about a little bit of the history of Philadelphia and kind of how it, uh, you know, how it aligns with uh, some of the national history. Because 1962, that's pretty remarkable because we're talking the Federal Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968. So Philadelphia was ahead of that curve by enacting this legislation in 1962. And it wasn't just Philadelphia. You know, we went to, we go to California, go on the other coast. In California, we've got in 1963, the Rumford Fair Housing Act was passed to end racial discrimination and, uh, you know, by property owners who refused to sell their properties to African Americans. Now, this was a big win in California because people were like, wow, this is great. You know, we've got equal housing that's being created. And, you know, this, denied, uh, you know, this was, this was, uh, this prohibited landlords from denying housing to people because of ethnicity, religion, or national origin. So again, this was 1963. This was before the Federal Fair Housing Act. Unfortunately, we showed up. And by we, I mean us as realtors, because what we did in 1964, the California Real Estate Association, sponsored the initiative that created the constitutional amendment that counteracted all of the effects of the run for that. So Pro Proposition 14 was, uh, was, was found, uh, excuse me, was, uh, was passed and it overturned everything that the Rumford Fair Housing Act created. And you see the sign, Realtors Foster Bigotry. Um, yeah, we did. And that's why we're talking about this today. And that's why we have to do much better in terms of uh, you know, leveling the playing field and creating more equitable opportunities. Now, here I stand as an African-American in 2022, and all of you on this call certainly weren't around when these policies were passed and when these laws were created and all of this segregation was occurring in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. But guess what? We are all realtors. This is our organization and we own it, good and bad, because we all benefit from the National Association of Realtors and we suffer because of some of the things that occurred. So it's up to us to make sure that we're doing what's necessary to create better outcomes in our communities. Um, Isabel Wilkerson in her book Cast talks about talks about um, how, old house. She has this great metaphor where she says, "If you buy a house that's a hundred years old, although you didn't build that house, you're responsible for maintaining it. You're responsible for improving it and upgrading it. And that's where we are today. We're responsible for all of these things that occurred in the past, and it's up to us to create." better outcomes. And we can do it together, that's for sure. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. That is an African proverb. And it is very apropos to what was taking place in the 1960s. Uh, and in particular, we've got the Watts Rebellion 
1965, uh, which resulted in 34 deaths and over $40 million in property damage. And this was, as Dr. King said, uh, it was really environmental and not racial. The economic deprivation, social isolation, inadequate housing, and general despair of thousands of Negroes teeming in northern and western ghettos are the ready seeds which give birth to tragic expressions of violence. And he was right about that because people were looking for opportunities and they weren't finding them. And many people attribute the Watts Rebellion to Proposition 14 that was passed by the, that was sponsored by the California Association of Realtors. Because here we've got the Run for Fair Housing Act, which is going to create opportunities for everyone to achieve housing equality. And then we have the Proposition 14, which counteracted all of that. So what more can you do? So um, Dr. King then went to Chicago, 1966, Chicago Freedom Festival. And there, what he did, uh, what he found was remarkable because he said that, you know, in all the years that he spent advocating for equality in Mississippi, in Georgia, in Alabama, uh, in other parts of the South, he never experienced the level of violence that he experienced when he got to Chicago. Because in Chicago, uh, and uh, as, as with many of the Northern states, what he found is that people loved to wag their finger and talk about the Southerners and say, you got to treat your Negroes better. But then once Dr. King came North, they were like, no, 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 you stay down there, leave us alone. Because Dr. King started to pull back the curtains of uh, the injustices and segregation that was taking place in Northern communities. In fact, he, the apartment that he was able to rent, the best apartment that he could get, he paid $50 a month for. And when he was touring around and seeing the apartments that white families would get, so the apartment that he could get, $50 a month, three room shack, dark and dingy, disrepair, best that he could get. In white communities, for the uh, white families were able to get these five and six room palatial apartments, bright and airy and, um, you know, good schools, parks, all of these things. And they were paying $40 a month. So not only were African-Americans getting less, they were paying more to get less. And that was something that he was uncovering during his time there in Chicago during his Freedom Festival. So in Philadelphia, so we've got um, uh, Friends Suburban Housing. What they did was, this was a non-discriminatory real estate brokerage that was founded by a group of Quakers. And what was happening is that it made major breakthroughs and in fact won a Pennsylvania Supreme Court case against the mainline board of realtors for illegal restraint of trade because it denied, and this is the mainline board of realtors, denied the Friends Suburban Housing the use of the multiple listing service. So as a result, they were able to, they were successful in uh, you know, uh, achieving a Supreme Court win for the Pennsylvania Su Supreme Court because the mainline Board of Realtors was trying to keep them out of the MLS because they were integrating neighborhoods. Uh, they had a non-discriminatory real estate brokerage uh, there. So that leads us to 1968. Now, 1968, we all know we have the Civil Rights Act. So the Civil Rights Act of 1968, what it did was it prohibits discrimination of race, color, religion, and national origin. We know this is the Fair Housing Act. So um, if we say that, you know, so, this might sound familiar, what we're talking about here, Fair Civil Rights Act. You said, well, Nate, didn't we have a Civil Rights Act back in 1866 that was supposed to end housing discrimination? So what happened, what, what's happening in 1968 that makes this one any better? Um, what makes this one any better? How is this one gonna work? Because we know that in 1866 it passed, but it, as you said, it didn't have any teeth so there was no real enforcement mechanism. So nobody paid attention to it. So how do we know that anything is going to be different in 1968? Well, we've got a test. So we've got a test 
Jones versus Alfred H. Mayer Company. This is 1968. So the Jones family, African-American family, wanted to buy a new home, new construction from the Alfred H. Mayer Company. Mayer Company says, nope, can't sell you a house. You're black. This is a white neighborhood. Now, said, can't sell you a house. Hmm, not won't sell you a house. Why would he have said, can't sell you a house? Well, although the Supreme Court just ruled that the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination based on these protected classes, FHA still wasn't there because it wasn't until the mid seventies before FHA loosened some of their policies in terms of integrating neighborhoods. So just because the Supreme Court said it didn't mean that FHA was going to adhere to it. This case was um, argued, uh, was brought, was, 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 um, was brought, was argued in the Supreme Court in February of 1968, the Fair Housing Act was passed in April of 1968. And this case was decided in August of 1968. And the decision was, Mr. Mayor, you must sell a home to the Jones family. Not only that, but you must also pay all of their legal fees. So here we have it. We've got a win. This is a real win with some teeth. With some teeth. So now we got the Civil Rights Act. So it's 1968. We've got all races, all colors, all religions, all national origins, holding hands, singing kumbaya, racism in America is over, housing discrimination in America is over, all right? Okay, all right. No, you're right. We didn't quite get there. Unless, because if you were a woman, it wasn't until 1974 that the Housing and Community Development Act was amended, or was, excuse me, the Housing and Community Development Act was passed, which amended the Fair Housing Act to include sex as a protected class. Now, we're talking about 1960, 1974. Here. This is not that long ago. 1974, it would have been perfectly legal for someone to say, no, I'm not selling you a home. You're a woman. Um, go get your daddy. Go get your brother. Go get your boyfriend or your husband uh, to buy the house because I'm not going to sell it to you. Perfectly legal. 1974 was not that long ago. And what they said in Congress was they said that um, women cannot perform the home ownership tasks that men can. So as a result, if we allow single women to buy homes, then they're not going to be able to keep them up and they're going to fall into disrepair and lower property values in the neighborhood. That was the argument. In United States Congress in 1974, that was the argument. Um, and fortunately, it did not win the day. And what's interesting about today is that single women represent twice as many home buyers as single men. Single women represent 17% of home, single home of all home buyers and uh, single men represent just about 8% of all home buyers. So quite remarkable. So it seems that we might've solved that a little bit. So now, yes, we've got all races, all colors, all national origins, all religions. We've got men and women holding hands singing kumbaya. It's all good, unless you were in a wheelchair, because it was not until 1988 that the Fair Housing Amendments Act was passed, which added disability and familial status as protected classes. 1988, folks, not very long ago at all. 1988, right? Perfectly legal for someone to say, I'm not going to rent you this house because you're in a wheelchair. Or, you know, I don't want kids in this apartment building. Kids are noisy. Perfectly legal to do that. 1988. Madonna had hits in 1988. It just was not very long ago at all. So, you know, we've got to keep that in mind that this path has not been, has not been quick and certainly has not been that long ago before we sort of corrected some of, the, some of these policies um, that allowed for discrimination to occur among all of these people.
So when we look at disability, disability, of course, we know that not every disability uses a wheelchair and not all disabilities are visible. Disabilities are a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, walking, seeing, learning, working, or having a record or being regarded of having such an impairment. So that is a disability. And what we know is that there are ways that we can ways that we can address some of these some of these issues to kind of help people get across uh, you know you know achieve housing opportunities. So we've got a Supreme Court case or a, a court case. This one did not make it to the Supreme Court, but it was a federal federal case, federal fair housing disability. So this is Anderson versus the city of Blue Ash. So the Anderson family have it has a daughter and she has mobility issues. So as a result, she uses the services of a miniature horse to get around the backyard and kind of, you know, walk around. Um, City of Blue Ash says, they look, you're not allowed to have any farm animals here. This is a, you know, this is a neighborhood. We got an HOA over here. You can't do that. So um, it went to court. What do you think the court said? You think they you said you can keep the horse or you got to get rid of the horse? Katie, thank you. That's absolutely right. Reasonable accommodation, you get to keep the horse. And this was, so this is, this is what happened. You got to keep the horse. And because the horse, having the horse would be considered a reasonable accommodation to, um, uh, to your policy that may exclude horses in general. Um, so another type of reasonable accommodation that we would see is that in an apartment, apartment building where maybe you don't have designated parking someone that has mobility issues may request to have a reserved parking spot close to their unit so you say we don't have reserved parking but it would be reasonable to reserve this spot for this person who has the disability that's a reasonable accommodation so we also have reasonable modification so reasonable modification would be Something like adding grab bars or, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, grab bars in a, in a, in a home uh, so that someone can, um, can, you know, be a little bit more safe that has maybe some, 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 some challenges. Um, reasonable accommodation would not be, I need you to widen the hallways so that my wheelchair fits through. That's not reasonable. So there's reasonable, there's not reasonable. And as a result of the horse, we have two animals that can be considered service animals, a dog and a miniature horse. Those are the only two animals that can be service animals, which is different than a support animal. Anything can be a support animal. You could have a support monkey, a support rabbit, support snake. There's a difference between service and support, um, but it is a reasonable accommodation to allow the animal in the property when your typical policy would not be to allow pets because the service and support animal is not a pet. Keep that in mind as well. All right, so let's talk about familial status for a moment. Familial status refers to the presence or potential presence of a person under the age of 18 in the home. That's it. Um, presence or potential presence person under the age of 18 in the home. So that is a reason, uh, that's a familial status. Um, steering, we didn't talk about steering. And steering is when you are, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure to mention that because that's one of the areas I think that we as realtors are most vulnerable in terms of potentially violating the Fair Housing Act is through steering. Because what happens is that someone may call us and say, oh, yeah, I want to buy a house in Philadelphia, but maybe they don't know exactly where they want to be, what neighborhood specifically. And you say, oh, OK, no problem. You want to be here, here and here, not there. Now, oh, you've got kids. This is the place that you probably want to be in. 
Um, and that's the violation because we as realtors need to be providing the options and let the client make the decision. We give choices, the client makes the decision. So that's where we land today. So we have our seven protected classes, race, color, religion, and national origin, which were passed in the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968. We added sex in the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974. And then we added disability and familial status in the Fair Housing Amendments Act of 1988. So that's where we're at uh, federally. Now, some states and some cities have protected classes that are in addition to what we have listed here. And our National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics, we have two additional classes that are not listed here. What are the two classes that are protected by our National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics that aren't listed here? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Genetic. No, but good guess. Thank you, Melody. Okay, so it is sexual orientation. Ah, there it is. Thank you, Katie. Sexual orientation and um, gender identity. Thank you, Melody. I was kind of wondering what genetic... Um, so um, anyhow, anyhow, sexual orientation and gender identity. Those are the two additional protected classes that are uh, codified by our code of ethics. Now, having said that, the um, uh, current uh, federal administration has given guidance that says that sexual orientation and gender identity are included in the Fair Housing Act, the Federal Fair Housing Act, under the sex category. Um, so there's a white paper that was issued by FHA that says that. So, uh, but it's not actually codified in the actual law. So when are protected classes not protected? What would be an example? Who has an example of when a protected class is not protected or an exception to the Federal Fair Housing Act? Any, anybody have an example of that, an idea? Owner-occupied duplex, says Katie. That is correct. Yes, so if you, you, you own and occupy fewer than four units, then you may, um, you may be more selective in terms of who is going to reside as your neighbor. Um, yes, that is absolutely right. So you can say, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm a man, I don't wanna live, uh, I've got a duplex, I wanna rent to another man, women are crazy, I don't wanna live next to a woman. So I might be able to say that, I couldn't say that of course, because I'm a realtor um, and realtors can't discriminate at all, but that certainly would be an area where, um, uh, where, where, a, uh, where a protected class is not protected. Now, having said that, um, you may never ever discriminate based on race. So another place where, and that actually goes back to the Civil Rights Act of 1866. This is where this comes back home. Um, now having said that, another area is 55 and older communities and 62 and older communities. Those places are able to, are excluded from or exempt from uh, familial status because they don't allow people, I believe it may be under 35 to live in the, to live in the units. So that is um, an area where uh, a protected class is not protected. Uh, Melody says, when they have a record. Um, I think that, so having a record, and I assume you mean like a criminal record, uh, that is not a protected class. So, there is something that deals with having a record. So you can't have a blanket policy that says, 
if you've ever been arrested, then need not apply. Okay, that would be because that has what we call a disparate impact. So a disparate impact is a negative impact on a protected class based on a policy that may not be specifically directed at that group of people. A good example of this, if I had a apartment building and said, you know, um, you can, you know, every, I'm going to, I'm going to limit applicants of this apartment building to people who have hair no longer than two inches. Okay. So your hair may be no longer than two inches. So if that's the case, then although it's not specifically identifying women, there's a much higher likelihood that women are going to have hair longer than two inches than men. So as a result, it's gonna have a disparate impact on women. So that is a policy that I could have. Now, in terms of record, again, the, not a protected class. So uh, if, you, if you've got a blanket policy that says no matter what you've done, don't apply, that could be an issue, but it's still specifically not a protected class. But thank you for sharing that, Melody. Okay, so we talked about blockbusting, inducing homeowners to sell at reduced prices by inferring that the imminent entry into their neighborhood of persons of a particular race or national origin will devalue their properties, redlining, denying or restricting loans to or in particular areas or community. So that is where we are at today. So I'd love to uh, hear some thoughts or answer any questions that you may have at this point. Anybody have any questions or thoughts that they'd like to share at this point? Ah, oh, thank you, Katie. Oh, thank you. All right. So, um, amazing, says Melody. Wow. All right. Um, all right. Well, we've got we've got some more. I've got some more. <laughs> so we can, we'll, we'll, we'll move along a little bit. Thank you so much. Thanks for your, your kind words, everybody. Um, but let's, uh, let's, let's shift gears a little bit. And I want to touch, uh, let's see here. I want to touch a little bit on bias. Okay, so we're, we'll touch just briefly on bias. And by the way, there is a new course that the National Association of Realtors has called uh, Bias Override which goes in great detail on um, what I'm going to talk about just for a moment. Because what we're talking about here in terms of bias is part of that education. Because we talked about the education that people have. And with bias, there's two types of bias. We've got explicit bias. And explicit bias is gonna refer to the attitudes and beliefs that we have about a person or a group on a conscious level. All right, that's explicit bias. And then we've got, implicit bias. Now, implicit bias is going to refer to the attitudes that we have at an unconscious level, okay? So we've got explicit and implicit. So explicit, we know that we've got it. I say that, you know what, I know that I don't, um, uh, you know, that I don't like Rocky Road ice cream. That's an explicit bias. So an implicit bias would be, you know what, I don't, I don't know, um, you know, I say that I like all ice cream equally, but the reality is that I have an implicit bias uh, against Rocky Road ice cream, even though I'm not aware of it. So this type of bias can be more insidious or is more insidious than the explicit bias, because in this bias, I don't even know that it exists. And that can be a real challenge for me in terms of how I'm interacting with people, because it could really influence what I'm doing in terms of helping people make housing decisions. So if we look at the average American male, the average American male, and this is an example of how this works, the average American male is five foot nine inches tall. The average Fortune 500 CEO is nearly six foot tall. 14 and a half percent of American males are over six foot tall. However, 58% of Fortune 500 CEOs are over six foot tall. 4% of American males are over six foot two inches tall, yet 
of Fortune 500 CEOs are over six foot two inches tall. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we believe that taller men are more capable of being Fortune 500 CEOs? I don't see any head shaking either way. I see a couple of heads shaking now. No, no. Um, so yeah, the actual answer is yeah, we believe that because this is what we do as a society is we put these taller men in these positions. Now, it's not like we have an ad in the paper that says, you know, we're advertising for a Fortune 500 CEO, need not apply if you're under six foot tall. That's not what it says. But what happens is that we inadvertently, implicitly provide opportunities to these taller men to put them on the track to become the Fortune 500 CEOs. And it probably goes back to our early man days when, uh, you know, you know, taller, stronger people, we needed them to protect us from the lions and bears and all that stuff that we and other dangers that we would encounter in the wild. But I don't know the last time any of you encountered any bears in the wild, uh, on unless you did it on purpose. But for most of us, we're living in a sort of, you know, urban circumstance, which allows us to stay away from those types of um, those types of dangers. So that is uh, so, but I still believe that that is, that that is, um, that that's, that that is probably why we have that, we have that challenge. Okay. So let's see here. What did I, did I have something in the chat? Okay. Katie said, or a woman, and maybe, maybe that may have been in response to this, because yes, I did say men, because the majority of Fortune 500 CEOs are in fact men. So if we go back, though, let's look at Catherine Graham. Catherine Graham, she became the first woman CEO of a Fortune 500 company in 1972. And Franklin Raines, he became the first African-American CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And this is in 1999. By the way, Catherine Graham became the first woman Fortune 500 CEO in 1972. That had been two years before she was able to buy a house by herself, by the way. So that's something to note. Um, as of November 2020, there are 41 women that are Fortune 500 CEOs, 8.2%. Um, you might say, oh, okay, well, that's pretty cool because women make up just about 10% of the population, right? No, okay. I, no, women do not make up 10%. In fact, women make up more than 50% of the population. So as a result, one would expect that there would be maybe not 50%, but certainly more than 8% because there's a lot of other factors that go in that. But the reality is that just because we change some policies and laws doesn't mean overnight it's going to have the effect that we desire it to have. And that's certainly the case here. It takes time and we have to open the doors and do more things to open doors because as of February 2021, there are just four African-American CEOs, less than 1%. So in terms of bias, uh, Anais Nen said, we see things as they are. Uh, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, one of my favorite authors, he talks in his book, uh, Blink, about micro-impressions. And in, when he talks about micro-impressions, he talks about the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. So this is back in the 70s, early 80s, I believe. At the time, it was fairly uncommon for women to be part of the orchestra, unless they were playing the harp or flute or some type of delicate instrument. Uh, they weren't there. And they specifically were not playing the violin. And um, New York Philharmonic says, hey, look, we're one of the most respected orchestras in the world. We need to do a better job of welcoming women into our orchestra. And we need to find women that are able to you know, perform at the level of the men so that we can integrate this orchestra and really you know, provide more value for our patrons. Then others will say, well, we can't hire somebody just because she's a woman, because, I mean, that would be a disservice to our patrons who come to see the best 
musicians in the world. Okay. I said, well, is it true that women just aren't as good as men at playing the violin? Well, next time we do an audition, how about we do a blind audition? And that's what they did. So they put up screens and they had everybody take off their shoes and they'd come and audition. So you couldn't hear them walking and they wouldn't say anything and they would just play. Okay, so they were trying to bring in, uh, again, remember they were, they were, this was an orchestra that was purposely trying to hire women and couldn't do it. So they auditioned all these people who were trying to, who were playing the violin and they said, all right, number 23, come on out. Number 23 comes on out. It's a woman. They're like, oh, yes, this is wonderful. We found a woman. And then they say, all right, number 37, come out. It's another woman. Oh my gosh, this is phenomenal. We found another woman. Number 67, come out. It's another woman. So once they put up these blinders, their top three candidates were women, were women when before they couldn't find any women. And they were like, oh my gosh, well, how did this happen? We finally found women that were as good as men. Where have they been hiding? Of course they weren't hiding anywhere. They were always there. It's just that they couldn't take out of their mind once they, their lying eyes, once they saw that this is a woman, they couldn't switch that they had a belief that women were not as good as the men, even though they said that that wasn't the case. They would say, no, 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 we believe in equality. Women are just as good as the men. We just haven't found women that are as good as the men. But their perception, it's that implicit bias that happens. And this happens with us as realtors, because when we encounter people that are different than us, then implicitly, we may have a reaction to them. And we may have a reaction that may result in us treating them differently. And that would be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act, as we know. And we have to work to uncover and discover these implicit biases that we have so that we can mitigate them. And if you go to, uh, if you type in, if you Google Harvard Implicit Association, there's a great test that you can take. It's like a quick five, 10 minute thing. And it'll kind of help you understand some of your own implicit associations. So I would encourage you to check that out. And where that comes shows up in real estate as well is over the phone. This guy calls on the phone. He may have a different experience than this guy and this guy. Because what we know is that African Americans have to search for one and a half as much, you know, over 50% more time than their white counterparts to find housing. And that's because housing is said to not be available for um, some people when it's said to be available for others. And a lot of this is done through what we call linguistic profiling, where someone calls and they, you know, sound black. Um, now the housing is not available when they sound white, the housing is available. Um, now, I, some of this is happening intentionally where people go, oh, I don't want to really want to rent to black folks. So they say that the housing is not available when someone sounds black or someone sounds Hispanic. Um, but then I think there's another way that it happens as well. And this goes back to our familiarity, because what happens is, um, you know, I think that the black guy calls and the person on the other end of the phone may not be as familiar with interactions with African-Americans and says, no, the housing's not available. And it's a quick conversation and it's over. But when the white guy calls and, say, and they say, well, the housing's not available, but there's more to it. They may say, well, but we've got a unit just like it coming available next week. So it creates more opportunities because there's more of a sense of familiarity because you've got the sort of sameness of the two people that are having that telephone exchange. I think that happens as well. But the result is in unequal treat is unequal treatment based on uh, based on racial categories. And you know, I uh, this 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 slide. I remember showing the slide a while ago. To someone and they said, well, the black guy, he just doesn't look happy like the white guy does. Um, and I was like, huh, okay. And I looked at the, and I looked because I selected these images because I felt that 
all of them had basically the same neutral face, the same neutral look on their face. And um, so I went and I remembered that there was an uh, implicit association video that the National Association of Realtors produced. And I went back and found it. So I wanna show you this quick clip that can impact us as well. So take a look here. Implicit bias affects who we see. Implicit bias can lead us to misread facial cues. In this study, people were asked to select when the face moved from angry to happy, being shown either the top or bottom row. As you can see, these are the same faces other than the hair and skin color. A majority of the white participants interpreted the face on the top row as happy at the third expression, but the bottom row at the fourth. This is just one example of many studies showing that across racial groups, reading of faces and seeing emotion can be difficult. Across group, we can see the obvious emotions of anger or happiness, but we have a hard time seeing anguish or hope. Being able to identify secondary emotions is the basis for empathy. So I thought that was kind of interesting because I think that that is, I mean, that illustrates the point about that the, the person who said that the person looks, doesn't look as happy. Um, and this is where we've got to work as realtors to implement the equal professional service model because we're not going to be aware of all of the spaces that we may have a bias. So the best thing for us to do is to make sure that we're adopting policies in our business practices that ensure that we're treating all people the same way. And that's what the Equal Professional Service Model does. It's a set of policies and procedures that help us provide the same level of service to all consumers. And it involves consistent practices and in making the initial contact all the way to letting the customer setting their own limits. Um, and I'll kind of show you what that looks like here. So first question we have is, do I use systematic procedures? Do I use systematic procedures? So this would be uh, if I'm working with a buyer, uh, do I have a buyer consultation that I sit down and discuss with them and go over? And yes, do I do that? Um, so somebody calls on the phone and says, I want to look at the house at 123 Main Street. Uh, based on how they sound, do I just jump in my car and go show them the property or do I ask them a litany of questions before I do that? Uh, by the way, we shouldn't just be jumping in the car and showing people property anyway, but some of us do that. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, they just sounded qualified. What does that mean? They sounded qualified, right? So uh, we've got to have those systematic procedures to ensure that we're, that we're starting off by treating everybody the same way. So that phone conversation, somebody says that they want to, they want to, um, you know, they, uh, you know, they want to live in Philadelphia. Um, are you going to, what follow-up question are you going to have? Do you say, uh, you know, they say, I want to live at 123 Main Street. I want to look at the house at 123 Main Street. Do you invite them into your office or do you just show them the property? Do you ask for a pre-approval letter or don't you? Those types of things are very important in terms of having a policy about how you're going to treat people. So assuming that you've got the systematic procedures, once you implement, adopt those, the next question that you want to ask is do I have objective information? So has the person been pre-approved? Has they have they given you a pre-approval letter, or did they just say we've talked to a bank, or did they just say you know no, but we're, we'll qualify, right? So objective is I have an approval letter. Uh, subjective is if you don't have an approval letter, no matter what was said, okay, you either have it or you don't. So that's objective information. So assuming you've got the objective information. Then you move on to the next one, which is, has my customer set the limits? So somebody calls, says, I want to live in Philadelphia. And you say, oh, I, you want to live in here, or this part of town over here, here, and here, and not show them all of the parts of town that, that's there for them. So you need to let them set the limits so that they are aware of everything that's available and they're the ones making the decision. And next, offering a variety of choices. Again, you want to make sure that what you're showing them meets the, cri the total criteria of what they've selected, not just the limited criteria that you've selected for them. Because we don't talk about safety. Uh, we don't talk about you know, the quality of schools. 
things like that. Those are things that we've got to allow the client to make the decision. We can be the source of the source, but not the source. So we want to give them a credible opportunity, uh, credible resources so that they can satisfy themselves of the quality of a school district or the quality and safety of the neighborhood. That's not for us to speak about because we all have our own unique backgrounds in terms of what we determine as being safe or what we determine as being a good school. So that is the equal professional service model. I encourage everybody to make sure that you're implementing that in your business. So moving along to 2015, we've got the Department of Housing and Community Affairs versus the Inclusive Communities Project. So this is a disparate impact case. So what the Inclusive Communities Project showed is that 90 nearly over 92% of all low-income housing tax credit project units in the city of Dallas were located in census tracts that were less than 50% Caucasian. So what was happening is they were putting poor brown people on top of poor brown people. And that is not the way to do it. That affordable housing should be spread across the entirety of a community instead of just in these specific locations. 2016, uh, because of widespread racial and ethnic disparities in the US criminal justice system, criminal history-based restrictions on access to housing are likely to disproportionately burden African-Americans and Hispanics. So this deals with, this was 2016, and this deals with, um, this, is, uh, this deals with uh, having that sort of blanket, have you ever been arrested? Because what we know is that African-Americans make up just 12% of the US population, however, represent 36% of the prison population. There's a whole lot of reasons for that, which we won't get into as we don't have time for that today, but a lot of that, it does go back to housing as well. Um, and so anyway, moving on, Bank of America and Wells Fargo versus City of Miami. So the City of Miami, um, Bank of America, Wells Fargo sued the City of Miami, or excuse me, City of Miami sued these banks because they were saying that you, during the lead up to the Great Recession in 2008, you were targeting these communities with your predatory loans. And that's exactly what was happening, is that these banks were basically peddling these loans to neighborhoods based on their racial characteristics. And even if you look at, there's a leaked emails from Wells Fargo, they would call these ghetto loans uh, that they were issuing to some of these areas because these are predatory loans and the banks would make more money on these. Um, because over 50% of people that receive these predatory loans would have qualified for conforming conventional loans. Um, and it was just the banks that were, that, uh, that were, um, that were, basically through greed, looking to um, you know, get more money. And once they made these loans, they were out of the picture. And that's what happened. And it destroyed a lot of communities because the foreclosure rates went up exponentially as a result of this in some of these neighborhoods. So moving along, Facebook. Anybody heard of Facebook? A couple of you? All right, yes. So what was happening with Facebook? Uh, so Stephen says, Philadelphia sued both institutions as well. What a coincidence. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that one I was not aware of, Stephen. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. So this was happening all over the country, certainly in terms of these banks and their predatory lending practices and what they were doing to um, destroy some of these uh, or no, they weren't, it, their goal wasn't to intentionally destroy communities. Their goal was that they didn't care. They just were, had a profit motive there. And once they made their money, they were gone and they didn't care what happened to these neighborhoods because they were packaging these loans and selling them on the secondary market. So they were no longer involved with it. So they didn't have a long, they didn't have a vested interest in what was gonna happen with these loans in the long run. So if we look at Facebook, what we see is that going in 2016, this is not that long ago, folks. So we've got detailed targeting. So in the detailed targeting, you can put the behaviors, someone's likely to move, buying a house, first time buyer, house hunting uh, as the sort of preferred, the, that's what you want to include. That's, what, that's the detailed targeting. Now you narrow the audience and exclude people whose behaviors are multicultural affinity, African-American, Asian-American, and Hispanic. 
your audience selection is great. So based on that, if you are African-American, Asian, Hispanic, you're not gonna see the ad that would result from this particular marketing effort for housing. So let's see here. Uh, let's see here. All right. Um, sorry, something just popped up on my screen. Um, okay, so okay. So here's an example of an ad. So here is another ad that was approved. So the targeting was living in the United States, housing. Here's a housing ad. Exclude moms, corporate moms, stay-at-home moms, new, new moms, moms of grade school kids, moms of high school kids, big city moms. So you're excluding based on familial status there. Here's another one. Exclude braille, guide dog, wheelchair accessible, um, wheelchair ramp, American Sign Language. So you're excluding based on religion. Here is another one. Judaism, Jewish home. You're excluding based on religion. So as a result, 2018, HUD filed um, uh, filed a housing discrimination complaint against Facebook based on that, saying that they were discriminating. This is 2018, folks. So Facebook said, oh my gosh, we'll fix it. Guess what? They didn't fix it because in 2019, HUD actually charged Facebook with the housing discrimination. This is 2019. Facebook is discriminating against people based on who they are and where they live. Using a computer to limit a person's housing choices can just be as discriminatory as slamming a door in someone's face. So that is what was happening. So my point here is this continues. We continue to have these challenges in our communities. Zillow, uh, anybody heard of Zillow? Yes, I think many of you have heard of Zillow. We've got some of the same things there. We've got um, neighborhood description, totally Caucasian, quiet, friendly place to raise your children. That's an ad that was approved by Zillow. Here's another one. I will not rent to any other ethnicities, other ethnicities other than Caucasian. So please don't inquire if you ain't white, white only. Okay. Um, they were approving these ads. It's inexcusable, inexcusable. Newsday had a three-year investigative, uh, three, a three-year investigation that uncovered widespread unequal treatment in Long Island. And what we saw here, and this was in 2000, at the end of 2019, we saw that if you are Asian, you've got a 19% chance of being shown homes in different neighborhoods than your white counterparts. If you're Hispanic, you've got a 39% chance of being shown different homes. And if you're African-American, you have a 49% chance of being shown homes in different neighborhoods than your white counterparts. So, you know, it continues. So again, you know, fair housing is still not fair. We still have a lot of challenges that we need to address as a country, as a society, and it's up to us. It really is, it's up to us as realtors because we're the ones that kind of help create this boat in terms of our organization. So we are the ones that need to fix it and to improve it so that we're providing equal opportunities uh, to everyone. So I hope that you found value in our conversation this morning. Thank you so much for your time and I will turn it back over to Matt. All right, let's give Nate a big round of applause. Thank you so much, Nate, for all of your insight, for challenge us to think differently. And then also too, for all those different Philadelphia bits that you wove into today's conversation. Um, it always makes it more relevant and easier to digest and, and think about when you have reference points that are local as opposed to, you know, if you were talking about another city somewhere across the country. Um, Again, folks, we've pushed on some different things uh, with our other endeavors earlier this year as it relates to fair housing. Remember, President Jake has uh, distributed the book to a lot of our members, The Color of Law. Uh, we'll be circling back to that later on in the year. It's a dense read. It's, it takes a little bit of time to digest it because there's a whole lot, and it dovetails right in with what Nate has been talking about here today. Um, so hopefully you guys have been reading the book. Fairhaven, who has visited Fairhaven? We hope you have done so. It's a really great exercise. It's easy to, to, to navigate through it. 
And even when you think you're hitting on all the points as it relates to fair housing, there's always something in there that makes you think two or three times before you actually click on the next path to take within that simulation. It's a, it's a really great, great tool that was created by um, NAR. The book is The Color of Law. Uh, PAR had a webinar earlier back in Fair Housing Month, which is April, where they had the author of the book talk. Um, and uh, if somebody wants, wants a copy of that, just let us know. We'll make sure we get it. We get one into your hands. So again, let's give another round of applause to Nate. Thank you so much, Nate. Thanks for helping us out today. We really appreciate it. And again, we've recorded this and we're going to be sharing this with the rest of our our membership again after we get it posted up onto YouTube. So with that, everybody, have a great day.